Okay, so I've been wanting to make a video about this game for a while because it's one of my favorite anti-London games of all time. And I remember when I first discovered this game, I was just in awe, very much like discovering an ancient form of art where I just wanted to stare at it and appreciate its beauty. And for anyone who despises a London, I hope this game will bring you some joy and some happiness in life. This is a reminder. Do the Audible sponsorship. Oh, that's right. This video, it's sponsored by Audible. Do the Audible sponsorship. Okay, let's do the Audible sponsorship. Audible sponsorship time. So I'll start by saying that I turned down almost all sponsorship and brand deal requests. But when the opportunity came to work with Audible, it was pretty much a no-brainer. I'm a huge fan of their platform, and uh, I've been an Audible member for the last several years. And I'll give a quick preview to my Audible library. I'm into a lot of the, the self-improvement kind of business genre audiobooks. And one book that I can't recommend enough is The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin. It talks about his experience not only as a chess player, but a world-class uh, competitor in martial arts. And he really dissects the science behind learning. And it's the type of book I think every chess player should read because it kind of gives you a big picture understanding of how to go from beginner to mastery, not only in chess, but really any field in life. So if you want to get this book for free, you can use the link audible.com slash I am Rosen or text I am Rosen to 500 500. And, uh, and I hope this brings you as much value as it brought me. So anyway, thanks again to Audible for sponsoring this video. And let's get back to some chess. Uh, this game was played between two grandmasters, uh, Mom Chil Nikolov playing black and Vladimir Kapekov playing white. And as we're going to see, the white player got pretty crushed as if he was an amateur. And uh, that's one of the beautiful things about this game is a play for black flowed very nicely. And uh, it, it seemed like white really didn't have a chance and it wasn't clear where white actually went wrong in this game. So opening started as you guessed it, a London opening and black plays C5. Now actually I checked this position on uh, the Lee Chess database and the most played move here is e6, which is another variation, but it's not a move I recommend because it immediately blocks in black slides for bishop. And very often you want to be flexible because there's cases where the bishop develops before you play pawn e6. So when black plays c5, this is going for kind of a more reversed queen's gambit setup where the knight develops behind the pawn. But not only that, but black frees open this avenue for the queen to come to b6 and potentially attack the undefended pawn on b2. And it's very common in the London for the pawn on b2 just to be a weak point in white's position because the bishop has committed itself so early and is no longer on c1. So the game progresses some very natural moves from both sides. Black plays bishop f5 and after knight f3 we see black be kind of the first player to make uh, a really immediate threat attacking the pawn on b2. And the combination of the queen on b6 and the bishop on f5 is quite nice because the bishop controls c2 and b1, so white doesn't have moves like rook b1 or queen c2 to effectively defend the b-pawn. So the most natural move here, which was played in the game, is queen b3 offering a queen trade. And now we reach kind of the stare down situation where black doesn't necessarily want to take on b3 because that would only strengthen white structure and white would then have the half open a file. Um, black really wants to make it so white trades here and then black can get the half open a file for himself. And with the next move pawn c4, this is exactly what happens. Um, white is pretty much forced to take on b6. A move like queen a3 is just terrible for white because e5 would hit the queen and be winning the bishop. So queens got traded and now 
I think a lot of players, if they looked at this position for the first time, they would maybe think it's it's dry, like both bishops develop, there's some symmetry. Um, but from a higher level standpoint, this is actually really pleasant to play for black. It's already slightly preferable for black, um, not only because black has the half of an A-file, more potential pressure on the queen side, but also has a space advantage with uh, the pawn advanced on c4 and potential later to play b5, b4. So white plays a3, trying to undermine the power of the rook, pawn b5. There are cases where black wants to play pawn b4, making use of this pin, so white just moves a rook to c1. And now black plays kind of a, a slightly mysterious move, but very common move for this position, pawn h6. And the reason to play pawn h6 before pawn e6 is there's cases where knight h4 could be annoying. And because the light squared bishop is one of black's best pieces here, really nicely pierces through the position, you don't want to trade it off for this knight. So the reason for black playing h6 is just to create a, a nice kind of pocket. So if ever knight h4, the bishop can safely hide on h7, where it still controls a really nice long diagonal. So play continues from here. Pawn h3, white kind of using the same idea to preserve the dark sword bishop. e6, and now bishop e2. Now I'm going to go ahead and hide the notation because I don't want to spoil what's about to happen next. And I'll start by saying that I think most players here would just kind of play automatically. Like they, they'd be inclined to complete the opening principles and just develop with bishop e7 and castle and go into the middle game. But this is already a case where black can start formulating a more clear plan. And the problem with bishop e7 and castling, there's really no clear um, like long-term plan. And this is a case where if black finds the right positional plan, it can cause massive, massive problems for white as we're gonna see in this game. So I'm gonna give this as an exercise to everyone watching. This is black to move and feel free to pause the video, take your time and then, then we'll discuss. Okay, so before I reveal the move, I do want to explain what the key weakness is in white's position. Because if you don't identify the key weakness, it's very unlikely you'll find the clear plan for black. And the weakness still turns out to be this pawn on b2. Even though it's not easy to attack, it's also not easy to defend. And all black needs to do is get one attacker against a pawn. Now, if we think a bit creatively and, and try and think, okay, how can we potentially attack the pawn? We can imagine a knight coming to a4 would would be very strong. And now if we think backwards, how do we get a knight to a4? Well, we can get there via b6. How do we get to b6 via d7? And then hopefully this will lead you to finding the key move knight to d7. And this is the first step in a three move maneuver to try and destroy white's queen side. And even though this looks slow, it is neglecting the, the king's side development for black. It's not easy for white to deal with. And we're going to see how quickly white's position will crumble because of this potential plan. So in the game, white played pawn g4, trying to create some distraction. Black very simply moves back to h7. And now bishop to d1 um, is a very typical move for white, trying to offer the trade of white squared bishops. And imagine if the bishops do get traded, then a rook can come and more effectively help defend the pawn. Uh, black continues, knight b6, bishop c2, and now we have a trade, takes and takes. And this leads us to another key position, because it looks like white just solved the problem of, uh, of the pawn not being defended. Now the rook happily defends the pawn. If you play knight a4, Okay, the knight looks pretty, but it's not doing anything. These pawns are super solid, and black needs to find another way to make progress in this position. And this brings us to the second kind of exercise of the game. This is black to move. Find the, the really, really nice... I don't know whether to call this a positional move or a tactical move. 
but find the brilliant move that Black played to completely devastate White. So if you don't see it, feel free to pause the video and take your time. Okay, so the move requires thinking a bit creatively and also not rejecting anything too soon. Uh, when we look at this position, we might think that the b4 square is off limits because white has two pawns very well controlling b4, but we can still put something on b4 and make it work. And the key move is pawn b4. Absolutely brilliant move. And the thing to realize here is this a pawn, it's no longer pinned to the rook, but it's pinned to the a1 square. If white ever takes, rook a1 wins material because of the back rank skewer. There's no effective way to block. If you king e2, it's probably one of the saddest king e2s, then you would lose a rook. So after b4, white is under pressure. The pawn on a3 is attacked. And really what black is trying to do is undermine the queen side and make it so there, there's weaknesses that can't be defended. Uh, what white played in the game was just castling. Now we should note if white takes on b4, black has a really, really nice response, knight takes b4. And again, if the a pawn takes, this is winning material for black. Even though you just lost a knight, you're going to win, uh, win the rook and, and be up at least the exchange. Another thing to mention is when the knight comes to b4 attacking the rook, we are also aiming to go into d3. So if rook moves back, we get uh, we get a very nice kind of quadruple fork. Of course, we're just interested in winning the rook next move. And if rook to c3, uh, again, knight d3, this time we're interested in winning the pawn, uh, which will probably result in winning both of the queenside pawns with just a crushing position. So in this game, after pawn b4, white castled. And here, black has a choice because you can win a pawn by taking on a3 and after takes, either take with bishop or rook. But black didn't go for this variation because when you win the pawn, white immediately gets counterplay along the b-file. And you always have to be careful when you win material, what are the possibilities of counterplay from the opponent? And in this case, it's a little bit uncomfortable because your knight's not defended, the pawn's not defended, and uh, white, white kind of can treat this as a, a gambit situation to get some annoying play. So rather than taking the pawn on a3, black played a really surprising move here, is pawn b3, forcing rook c1. And I remember when I first saw this game, I was shocked that black would play pawn b3, even though, okay, black is winning connect five for the memes. Uh, the, the position is now completely locked down on the queen side. And it seems as if black's not going to be able to make any more progress. Uh, what was played in the game, knight a4, was met with rook b1. It seems like white just has everything defended. So how in the world do you break through? But uh, as we're going to see, what comes next justifies Black's whole play leading up until this point. Because after rook b1, Black very happily goes ahead and plays bishop takes a3. Sacks a full bishop for the destruction of white's queenside pawn structure. And there are cases where trading a minor piece for some pawns is not so good. But in this case, it's completely justified because black is not only winning some of these key pawns, black is getting two very dangerous connected pass pawns. The A pawn is going to fall. There's fork potential on E2. So a move like rook C1 would just lose material. And the rest of the game was completely one-sided from here. And white really never had any hope for, uh, for surviving. So if we go forward, rook b2, the knight went in, traded itself off for the bishop, and then black finally wins a pawn on a3. And despite white having the extra knight, it's only so, so useful in the position. 
Um, and really the pawns are going to be the ones overpowering everything here. So rook c1, rook a2 is a nice move. If, uh, if the rooks get traded, then the pawn is always just lingering on the second rank, waiting to queen. Rook a1 would be met with knight to b4, and then the, the king and rook will, will come into play. Not to mention the pawn could potentially come all the way up to b3, and then black would win connect 6. So rather than taking the rook, white played rook uh, b to b1, black played knight a5. We're going to play through the next several moves, pawn b5 f5 and now black uh black castled in this position wasn't necessary kind of castling uh in in the end game but the whole point is to bring the other rook in to help support the advance of the pawns white goes for 95 pawn b4 93 and now b2 and when you have so many pawns like this so deep into the opponent's position uh, you can be pretty sure that the game is not going to last too much longer. Rook e1 played, pawn c3, creating this nice sort of chain. Knight d7, rook c8. You do have to give credit to the white player trying to create some complications here. But after rook c6, uh, knight takes d5 was kind of a last desperate attempt. And now the icing of the cake, black decided to sack even more material not even accepting the, the sacrifice on d5, but sacking the exchange on b6 to get the pawn to c2. And after king f3, knight b3, white threw in the towel here and resigned, given that uh, c1 promotes to queen is coming, or knight d2, just too many problems that white did not want to suffer further from here. So anyway, this was, uh, this was just a beautiful game. I really enjoyed how the play flowed very smoothly. Uh, from the initial opening, Black played kind of this, this nice sort of anti-London setup with the early queen b6 and bishop f5 and got kind of this, this nice middle game bind and then found the really nice positional maneuver to, to create initial problems on the queen side and then went for the very aesthetic pawn push to b4 and then the peace sacrifice to destroy white so again for people that uh, maybe want some inspiration of how to take down the london opening i hope uh, i hope this is just one game you can add to your toolbox of of ways to fight against a london and yeah if you have any questions leave your comments below and i look forward to seeing you in the next video